This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal, medical, or mental health advice. The views and opinions expressed by the host of My Brain is a Wonderland are exactly that. Views and opinions. This is Emily Ruth Henderson, and I'm the host of My Brain is a Wonderland, the podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. In 2020, after a hellish pandemic, I was diagnosed with ADHD and autism. Surprise! Now, I am passionate about reaching other women just like me who've been pushed aside, ignored, and misdiagnosed for far too long. Each week, I discuss my experience navigating my 30s with these two life-changing diagnoses. There'll be highs, there'll be lows, and everything in between when you join me for Season 3 of My Brain is a Wonderland. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I am so happy to be here with you. I've been having a couple of rough weeks at work, to be honest, and I could really use the connection and the release of this episode. So thank you for being here and thank you for supporting me. And just before we get into the second episode of Masking ADHD, the series, I just wanted to reach out to everybody who's listening and really implore all of you to spread the awareness of this podcast. If you have ADHD and or autism, tell a friend, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, whoever, your mentor, whoever knows that you are dealing with ADHD and or autism. Share this podcast with them and it might help them understand you better and it'll help spread the awareness of this podcast more. And I think we all need that. We need to get more information out there about what we're all really dealing with. And I'm not advocating for you to come out to anybody that you're not out to yet. Or if you're not out, don't worry about it. But if you are, this really could help people understand you and help get the message out. So I implore you to do that. And if you're not out or not comfortable doing that, I really want you to consider just rating me five stars wherever you're listening. I currently have on Apple Podcasts, I think eight reviews and on Spotify, 17. So they've been going up, but I have a few hundred people listening to this every week. So if you're one of those people who has not rated, reviewed, liked, shared this podcast, please do that because it really helps me kind of uh, realize I'm doing the right thing. It helps reach more people and get this message out there, which is going to help you in the end. It'll take literally a second. If you're on Apple Podcasts listening right now, just smash that five star. If you're on Spotify, Wondery, wherever. You don't even have to write anything. Just smash the five star button because that will help spread the message. And with that, before we get started, I wanted to read the latest written review that I got on Apple Podcasts because it touched my heart so much. And I only have three of them. I read the other two when I got them. And this one was left about two weeks ago. It was left on the 18th of January by, and I'm going to totally butcher this name probably, but Tamorama or Tamarama, maybe? Either way, if that's your name, it's absolutely gorgeous, and thank you for leaving this review. The title is, This Podcast is Changing My Life. I can hardly speak about Emily's Wonderland to my family and friends. Thank you for sharing. That was just my interjection there. With my family and to my family and friends without crying because of how many Me Too moments and ahas I've been given as I sit in my 44 year old female body. 
I am gobsmacked. I have known I was a theatrical, nerdy, imaginative, articulate only child. And I'm not sure what this word is, W-Y-R-D. I looked it up and there were a few different meanings. Is it weird, wired? I don't know. I'm both of those, so, you know. So, theatrical, nerdy, imaginative, articulate only child, weird, neurodivergent girl my whole life, but felt so alone and misunderstood and had no idea I might also be autistic. Then she puts a bunch of loving emojis. Embracing this truth may unlock my future self in ways I can only imagine right now. So thankful to your leadership, Emily. Presence, candor, compassion, courage, rich curiosity, and passion for education and lifelong learning that brought you into our lives and this moment. Wow. I just want to say thank you for leaving that. Like I said, it's been a rough couple of weeks for me at work, and I really needed to hear that. I really needed to hear that this is reaching people. Ugh, I didn't mean to get emotional, but how can you not get emotional when someone says that stuff about you? I really needed to hear that. It's been very difficult and uh, emotional. And so thank you. Thank you so much. And if anyone else listening would like to leave an absolutely awesome review like that, I will read it out on the air because it feels good. And I want you guys to know that we are connecting as a community. Even though we struggle to find friends, even though we struggle to keep up with communication, even though it's everything's a struggle, we are connecting as a community. When you listen to me, know that you are listening with hundreds of other people listening to the same thing, resonating with the same ideas and struggles, and you are not alone. I am here, and all those other people who are listening right now are here with you. We are a community, whether we meet ever or know each other or not. And so I just want to thank everyone listening for all the support and for spreading this message and for helping reach more people who don't know or have just been diagnosed with ADHD and or autism. So thank you. Okay, so let's get started on the second episode of my Masking ADHD series where I'm basically going to go through all of the masking symptoms that are listed on ADD.org. And I started last week with the first four symptoms for inattentive ADHD. And I have combined ADHD, inattentive type and um, hyperactive type. So I'm going to go through all of them. And today we are starting with and I'll read from the beginning, I like to do that. If you have this type of ADHD, which is inattentive type, you may mask in this following way, focusing intensively during conversations to keep up. So this is actually an interesting one because I know that if you have ADHD or autism and or it, you are more likely to have comorbidities. And what that means is you're, if you have ADHD, you're more likely to have autism, which I have both. And a lot of people listening may have both or not know if they have both or they've been diagnosed with one or what have you. But actually, when I was assessed for my ADHD, I was found to have very um, low auditory processing ability. And what that means is, is when, for example, someone is talking to me, I can't process what they're saying in a timely manner. So most people or neurotypicals can listen to a, a sentence and process it and understand it as it's happening. And I honestly can't describe to you what that's like because I don't experience that. For me, I, when something goes into my ear, it almost goes out the other side. Unless it's a very short sentence, like the cat sat on the mat, the cat sat on the mat, cat's on the mat, easy peasy. But when I was getting assessed, the assessor, the neuropsych, she was reading me stories and the, these were long stories. I mean, at first I thought, oh, okay. And I'll tell you if anyone's had it, I don't know if this is, they use the same stories, 
but I remember the first one, just the gist of it. And it was like, this girl's going with her dog and her dad, I remember that, to, I think they were going fishing. But it was like, it wasn't just like the girl, the dad, and the dog go fishing. It was literally like, the girl goes to pick up the leash and hook it into the thing and then has to grab her red jacket and her blue shoes. I'm making this up because I don't remember. And then I had to repeat the story back after. So verbally, after she finished, she said, tell me the story back and remember as many details as you can. And as she went on in this story, I thought, I've lost it. I don't even know what you're saying. And I was, and there was another story too. It was about a guy who worked as like this teenager worked at a store and he had to pack a truck with all this food and blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't recall most of the details of the story. So I could get the gist that she went to the pond with her dog and her dad and she like stood on a rock or something, but I couldn't recall most of the details. And it made me think about all the times where I go, huh, what? Or I come away from a conversation going, I don't even know what that was about. For example, I've never been able to do dictation. Dictation is when, for example, a teacher is just reading from a book and you're supposed to write it down. So I'm writing. And she's, he or he is talking, and I can't write and listen at the same time because I can't process what I'm hearing and write while listening also. I have to listen. You have to say like three words, I'll write them down. Say the next three words, that kind of thing. And I realized after diagnose, being diagnosed, I do it in conversations all the time. I remember I went to a Victoria's Secret with my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law. We were just shopping in general. It was like a Christmas shopping clothing trip. And this was uh, maybe 2021. So COVID was still... God, how are we going to talk about this to people? It sounds crazy. COVID was still like in full... Not full swing, but still swinging, I guess. And so when we went to the mall to go shopping, we were fully masked the entire time. It was very empty. And they made you line up, like queue outside the store with stanchions, which are those ropes, and you could only go in a few at a time. And there was a woman at the front of the line kind of giving you a spiel. And I was at the front in front of my mother and sister-in-law, and this woman is giving me a spiel. And I say, okay, at the end. And then my mother-in-law goes, what did she say? And I went, oh, I don't know. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? And thinking back, a lot of my uh, auditory processing or me hearing and understanding is based on assumption. So I said to my mother and sister-in-law after, I just assumed she was giving me the COVID spiel, which was stay six feet away, keep your mask on, blah, blah, blah. Don't touch things unless you think you're going to buy them, whatever. And that is probably what she was saying, but I didn't actually hear it and process it. I made that up in my head. And I only started realizing that after I was diagnosed, that when people talk to me, I almost hear nothing that they say. If they're telling me a story, I'm going, yep, uh uh-huh. It's hard for me to link a story together that's verbal. It's different maybe when I have visual cues, like I'm watching a movie, maybe, but I struggle to remember so many things. And so with this feature that is focusing intensely during conversations to keep up, for me, I think mine is related to auditory processing issues. But do most people with ADHD or ADHD inattentive type have auditory processing issues? And it's a comorbidity and it's actually not from the ADHD. I'm not sure. If you uh, reach out, if you've been diagnosed with both, or if you think that maybe that's a feature of ADHD is having auditory processing issues. But yes, I have to focus so intensely or intensively during conversations, and I almost never can. I kind of start to tune out a lot of the time, or I'll jump in when I think I have an answer. And inevitably, I've missed part of the conversation. I remember one time I was in a conversation with uh, co-workers from a job I'm not in now, and I thought they were talking about someone, and they were actually talking about someone else. And then I commented on the person I thought it was, and it wasn't that person. And they were like, yeah, that's not 
that happens. Sometimes people look at me like, are you on crack? Like, why did you not hear that? It just, uh, it's so frustrating because you come off either two different ways, right? You come off stupid, like you're so stupid. You just are like, you're an idiot. Or you come off that you're not paying attention, that you're inattentive. And it's like, well, I have inattentive type. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to not be inattentive. I'm literally looking at your m lips move constantly, trying to hear you, and it's not going in. And they look at you like, uh, yeah, like, okay, whatever. Don't listen then, or you're so stupid. I hate that. It's become a lot better since I've realized that that happens, which has really not improved my auditory processing. It's just, um, I'm less hard on myself. What I have done is, and I always did this, is I had um, subtitles on all the time. And I do that now unabashedly. I'm not ashamed of that. And in the past, I wouldn't always put them on, but I would be like, it's easier if I have subtitles on when I watch a movie or a TV show. Now they have to be on. They have to be on or I'm not going to understand the movie. So what happens is when I'm watching movies, it's almost like I'm deaf. When people are talking, I'm actually reading the subtitles. I'm not, I mean, you can look at a t the image, right? Because your eyes are big, you know, you can take in a huge amount of space with your eyeballs. But I'm looking at the image, but I'm reading the subtitles. I'm not just, they're not just there for fluff, you know? They are there because I have to read them or I will not understand what's happening. And honestly, in the past, there are so many movies I've seen at the movie theater that I would say, I don't remember that movie. I don't understand what it was about. You could ask me what happened in it, and I couldn't tell you. And it's because in movies in the movie theater, there's no subtitles. I will tell you this, that if you do go to the movies, they usually have behind the counter that you can ask for is an item. I've never asked for it, actually, because I'm so gun shy on us asking for this. So, you know, don't see me as some parable. Is it parable? Parable of whatever. See me as someone who's like, oh, she's doing all the right stuff. I'm so embarrassed to ask for it that I've never asked for it. But I know that there are things you can grab and it's like a little like iPad, I think. And you have it in the movie theater with you. And it puts subtitles on the iPad for you while you're watching the movie. It's not the best, I feel like, because you kind of have to keep looking back and forth. I also went to see Hamilton on stage and they had the same thing available. And I'm guessing it's like AI um, on like closed captioning in the moment. So it's not playing a script. It's hearing what people, because if it's in Hamilton, it's got to be on time with what people are saying. So it's hearing what, actually hearing what people say and then transcribing it. So that is an option. And I really want to try that option soon. I just feel so weird about it. I don't know why. Uh, it's my autism too. I don't want to approach people and be like, oh, can I? <laughs> I don't know. So yes, I absolutely do focus intensively on people talking. Like I said, is that ADHD or is it, um, auditory processing disorder that's comorbid or is auditory processing just part of ADHD? No idea. I ain't no doctor. All right, let's go on to the next one. If you have this type of ADHD inattentive, you may mask in this following way. Being extra early to events to avoid being late. So this is something I've actually tempered in the last couple of years or so, or maybe more than that. But yes, I used to be, to me, in the past, I had to be 20 minutes early minimum, maybe 30, to make sure I would be on time. Would have all of that anxiety about, okay, checking, you know, the, ma the Google Maps. How long does it usually take to drive? Well, 30 minutes to 60 minutes, depending on traffic. Okay, then I'm going to say 60 minutes. But I also want to be there early because if I leave at five and the appointment's at six, no, I'm not doing that. But actually, I have tried to let go of that a little bit and being so, so anxious about it. And I did that recently at a work trip I went to. They would say, you know, you have to be, I'd be in a hotel, right? Up in a hotel room and I'd have to be in the ballroom of the hotel by 8 a.m. And in the past, I would have definitely left at 
even though I'm just going down the elevator. And if the elevator didn't work or didn't take time, I could take the stairs, right? And it's not going to take more than 10 minutes. I mean, really, it's going to probably take three to five, depending on what floor you're on and how busy the elevators are. But it's not going to take more than 10 minutes to get to this ballroom. And I was actually proud of myself for doing that. I was showing up probably three to five minutes before the time requested. But then I had all this anxiety because I would show up second to last to this thing. And then I'm going, oh God, am I supposed to be early? Does that show professionalism? I don't know. But yes, I used to show up to things so early uh, because what people usually say is if you have inattentive ADHD, the reason you do that is because if you don't have this anxiety about showing up early, you'll always inevitably be late. I can't tell you if that's where that came from because I've done this for as long as I can remember. But maybe when I was younger, and this is not before teenagehood, or maybe I got it from my mom. You know, my mom, I'm almost positive, is neurodivergent. But I remember even as a teenager, I would show up chronically early all the time. And I would have a friend who would show up chronically late. This was back before you had a cell phone. You'd have to go to a payphone call their house phone. If they'd already left, you wouldn't be able to get in contact with them. And he would show up sometimes an hour late. Yeah, I know. That's awful. Okay. And I would sometimes be there not an hour early, but 30 minutes early. So then we're I'm waiting 90 minutes, right? But that has been an issue in my past. And really, the reason I started to try to let it go is because I had so much anxiety about it. Like getting a flight, was just a nightmare because I would be so hopped up and then I would get to the airport and I'd be sitting at my gate and I still had two hours to wait. That being said, the way I curbed it a little bit was doing things repeatedly. So to be honest, when I first, you know, started my job, I was chronically early, like 15 to 20 minutes early for when I had my first day, things of that nature, right? And then once you learn the traffic pattern, how long it really takes, when you really need to leave, then I would reduce it. But um, anyone who's out there dealing with this, you're not alone. But also you don't need to be there 30 minutes early. And if something goes wrong, think about how many people, here, think about how many people you work with or know who say, hey, sorry, there was traffic, um, I'm late. There was a crash on the bridge, I'm late, sorry. I My dog threw up, or whatever, you know, I was struggling to get it together. I used to look at those people, honestly, and judge them so harshly, and be like, would you get it together? Then leave 30 minutes early, because you know there could be an accident on the bridge, and you should be there. But you know what? That, I don't think, is how we should operate in a society that we're constantly judging people for for having to live in the real world, right? You can't always know what's going to happen, and you don't always want to hedge your bets and be like, okay, I've got to leave at this. Da, da, da. Like, you just want to live life sometimes. You just want to be present in life. And so I say to you, it's not the end of the world if you're late to something. Just communicate, like I said last episode, communicate that you're sorry. You don't even have to give a reason because some people will see that as an excuse. And it is kind of an excuse, right? Just say you're sorry. It is what it is. I'm sorry I'm late. If it's work, give an excuse. But <laughs> I'm sorry I'm late. The reason that came up actually is I did philosophy in college and uh, someone was late to class and he gave an excuse. And she said, but that's an excuse, right? And he said, well, no, that's the reason. And she's like, well, no, because there is no reason. In philosophy, it just is what it is. Like, you are late. That's the facts. You're late. And it doesn't really matter the reason. But I don't want to operate like that. And I think in a good world where we love each other and are trying to support each other and be human beings that understand we're all dealing with difficult things. Just say, I'm sorry I'm late, and then 
like I said, for work, give an excuse. Or if your mom's a hard ass, give an excuse. But it is what it is. Stuff happens in life, right? Stuff happens. And if people are being that hard on you, maybe reassess if you should have not a relationship with them, but if you have a job that is that hard on you, maybe reassess that. My job is very flexible. It's like show up, you know, before 10 or whatever, because it's an office job, and then do your daily, you know, your day from that time. You don't need to be somewhere unless there's a meeting. And we have people all the time who are like, oh, sorry, I had to go to the bathroom. I mean, nature calls. It it just happens. So yeah, I've struggled with that. I've kind of let go of it a little bit. And this is me giving you permission to let go of it a little bit as well. All right, the third one is if you have inattentive ADHD, you may mask in this following way. Having multiple alarms and reminders set up. Yes, yes, yepity yep, yes. I actually had to check in for a Southwest flight a couple of days ago. And if you know anything about Southwest, it's not assigned seating. So you don't get a seat. You just get a place in line. And so if you're ahead at the front of the line, you can pick wherever you want to sit. And I set up an alarm. I had to check in 24 hours before. So that was 2.55 p.m. the day before. And I set up the alarm for 2.50 the day before. And literally five minutes is too long for someone with inattentive ADHD because in those five minutes, I could forget. So then I set up an alarm for 250, 252, and 254 so that I would not forget it. And forget about snooze because sometimes you stop it and you forget to snooze it. But I set up multiple alarms because you will forget in between the time. And you don't want to set it up for 54 because it's 55. And maybe you don't have time in that minute to get to the place where, you you know. So I do that all the time. And actually in the past before, I mean, thank God for cell phones. Because in the 90s, what did people do? I mean, honestly, if you were an adult in the 90s, please tell me. Did you have like egg timers set up? Or were you just flying by the wheel of your pants? The seat of your pants? Yeah, the seat, not the wheel. I mean, because how did you set up alarms and reminders? You couldn't, right? You'd have to write things down and stick post-its all over the place. You'd have to, I don't, or, oh, I guess maybe if you had a watch in the 90s, could you maybe set that to give you an alarm at certain times? But can you set more than one on a digital watch? I don't remember. I don't know. So yes, I do that constantly, and I'm not ashamed of that, and anyone listening who doesn't do that, I super recommend it. I use my, my cell phone is glued to my body almost the entire time. It's, if I don't have my cell phone, I'm lost. And I use the calendar app constantly, put reminders, anything I do in life, it goes in the calendar app, or I will forget it exists. And then when I put something in, like I have to go to an event, say it's on a Friday, I set up reminders for the week before two days before, a day before, an hour before, so I can remember it's coming. Because if you set up a reminder that says an hour from now, you were supposed to be at a Broadway show or something, well, I ain't going to be there because I forgot about it. Or I chronically thought about it for months. I actually have a, it's a Broadway traveling show. It's Moulin Rouge. It's one of my favorite movies. And I'm going to see it in um, the city I live in, in Florida, when it's traveling on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. And um, I have thought about that four months since I booked it. And honestly, because it's on an important day, like Valentine's, I remembered it. But it's still in my calendar with like, I think, three or four reminders paced out. So I super recommend that if you don't use your cell phone to beep yourself constantly, you really should be. Um, It's super beneficial and will get you out of a lot of trouble with friends, family, co-workers, and managers. All right, and the fourth and final one is, if you have inattentive ADHD, you may mask in the following way, writing everything down. Yes, yes, yes. I write it down on paper. I write it down on the notes app on my phone. I actually, when I'm 
de-stressed when my life is easy and flowing well, like work is easy, I have a lot of spare time, I'm not in school, things like that. I kind of don't have to. And I tell people, if you see me writing on my hand, which I used to be a chronic hand writer and realized it looked psychotic and unprofessional, I say to people, if you see me write, I say to this at work, uh, to people at work, if you see me writing on my hand, I've lost my mind. And that's funny, right? I'm making a joke, but it's true. If you see me writing on my hand, it is because I have reached a point where if I don't write it on my hand, I will forget it. I'm so overwhelmed that I just don't know what else to do. And I say to people, you know, I'm not going to lose my hand, so I write it on my hand. Another thing that I do, I don't know if everyone listening knows this, but you can text yourself. So if you have your own cell phone and you put your own cell phone number in the to, you know, to this person section, you can text yourself reminders. So I will text myself, da da da, press send and quickly get out of the app so that you know when you get the drop down notification on your phone where the little icon is at the top, if you're out of the app when the message arrives, it'll stay there. And so if I need something short term, like I need to remember to pick up an onion on the way home. I need to remember to go to the bank on the way home. I need to remember to do this for school. Very short term, like just that day, I will text it to myself. And that's been actually very beneficial. I'll text lists to myself. And it's because with ADHD, especially inattentive type, you can put stuff in the notes app. Are you going to go to the notes app? Are you going to remember to go to the notes app? Do you need to put a reminder, an alarm to remember to go, like, kill me now. I, I can't. I, it's so many things to remember to do anything. And traditionally, for people with ADHD, inattentive type, out of sight, out of mind. So if you cannot see it, you will not remember it. Which is why so many people with ADHD carry around a physical uh, calendar in their bag. Because I forget the doctor. He's a He's very famous you know, not famous, famous, but like like Obama, but famous in the ADHD community. Barkley? Berkeley? I forget. He's a cute older guy with kind of a balding thing, white hair beard. If you are on TikTok and ADHD stuff, you know him. And he said that for inattentive ADHD or ADHD in general, it's better to have a physical diary, a calendar, so that you're writing stuff into And so you're writing everything down because once it goes kind of into a digital calendar, it can kind of go out into the ether and you never see it, which is why I'm glued to my phone and everything that goes into my calendar has a million notifications. But if your phone's on silent, right, you might forget it. But yeah, I write everything down. I'm a classic note taker, list taker. If someone is saying something to me, it has to be written down. Here's the thing I do at work. I do not answer the phone. Okay. If you call me cold, that's half a millennial thing, half an ADHD thing. If you call me out of nowhere, I am not answering it. Leave a voicemail. And here's the thing. We're going to chat on the phone. You're going to say a bunch of stuff. I'm going to say stuff. And then I'm going to say to you, follow it up with an email with all the stuff in it. What was the point of this phone call? I didn't get anything. I have to take all these notes. Just send it in an email. Whatever you're you know, going to do things because then we can track it. I can refer back to it. I can't refer back to a phone call in my mind. If someone says, hey, this needs to be done, that needs, well, uh, you know, first of all, I can't dictate. I can't take dictation. So if you're saying it and and I'm trying to write it down, you need to go a lot slower. And I'll probably lose those notes. How many people have kind of, I have maybe four or five notebooks for work and I sometimes misplace the note or where I put it. So Yeah, I write everything down. My hand has been my favorite place, but I've backed off of that. When I was a professional dancer, I started backing off of that because I was a ballroom dancer and you hold hands with people and it was embarrassing to be like, oh, there's, it says, you know, buy tampons on my hand. Yeah, maybe not. So I definitely write everything down and that is not something anyone should stop doing if you have ADHD. Don't be embarrassed of that write everything down. Put everything in your calendar. Another thing I do is I have a magnetic calendar on my fridge, which 
I actually stopped doing, but it was super helpful. I would also put events in that. So it was a month calendar and each month I would redo it so that you would go into the kitchen, you know, in the morning and you would see, oh, right, in two weeks I have this. Oh, right, don't forget that. And just every day it was a little reminder to keep it on your mind. Otherwise, it was just out of your mind. So those are a few tips there from me. And have multiple alarms and reminders set for those things so you don't forget. So that's the end of the list of inattentive type ADHD masking symptoms. I didn't actually, I didn't really go into masking on this because honestly, I feel like these are just things we do. Are we doing it because we're masking? Am I focusing intensively? Well, to keep up, yeah, I guess, yeah. You're focusing intensively because you don't want to show people that you're unfocused, right? You don't want to show people that, oh, I didn't get that conversation. Uh-oh, right? And then being extra early to events, yeah, I guess that is masking. You don't want people to be like, well, she's late all the time. Like my friend that I said, right? That he was an hour late minimum all the time. You Maybe he had ADHD. I don't know. You don't want to be that person in your life. So then you start showing up early. Having the multiple alarms and reminders, same sort of thing. When you forget something, it's so embarrassing, right? It's so embarrassing when you forget to meet up with your best friend even. And then that best friend says, look, I can't do this anymore. You're putting in less effort than I am. And then you've, you're like, I'm putting in so much effort. I'm so sorry. And the fourth one, writing everything down. Yeah, because you don't want to forget it, anything. So maybe that's your way of masking, your way of making sure that you remember everything, you do everything right, and it's on time. So I relate to all of these, as you heard. And if you do, reach out to me. Let me know how you relate. You can reach me on my brain is a wonderland pod at gmail.com. And don't forget to share this podcast with someone you know and love and or leave a review, five star, wherever you're listening. And I will see you again next week when we're going to start ADHD hyperactive masking symptoms from ADD.org. And it'll be the third episode of this series on My Brain is a Wonderland, season three. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.